So we'll continue now. Uh, is the microphone, this one, working now? Okay. Um, so we'll continue now with our second presentation. Uh, it's titled A Novel Theory of Gender in Performance, Implications for Contemporary Practice. And it'll be given by Jack Mao. Uh, just a couple of words on Jack, who is pursuing his Masters of Music in Performance at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. He's supervised by Professor Neil Perez de Costa and Dr. Amanda Harris. So his research examines the socio-cultural perception of gender in 19th century piano music, specifically the late works of Beethoven and Schubert. Jack previously studied at the University of New South Wales under Elizabeth Green and Dr. Christine Logan, and the University of Colorado Boulder under Professor Andrew Cooperstock and Associate Professor Jennifer Hager. Uh, Jack serves on the piano faculty at the Wollongong Conservatorium of Music and has performed recitals in the US, Germany, and Italy. Please make him welcome. Good, all right. <laughs> okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, uh, they're the traditional custodians of this land where the Sydney Conservatorium is built and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So, um, so my research work is in gender in uh, classical era music, um, and, uh oh yes. <laughs> Let that one now. Um, and so, uh, uh, I look at the uh, construction and the perception of gender in classical era music. I've borrowed ideas of gender that have influenced me from that study, um, uh, and specifically um, uh, from Ruth Soli and Helene Sixou, and applied it to the performance of Chopin um, uh, in, I suppose, my attempt of reimagining uh, my interpretation of his music. So I'd like to start with this quote by Ruth Soli. Um, uh, if we understand man here as the universal term for human beings, as common sense exegesis suggests, we must nonetheless construe woman as particular and thus oppositional. This quote really helped me to situate my perspective on the topic uh, by advocating a theory of gender uh, based on difference. The terms uh, masculine and feminine uh, is really quite complex. Uh, you know, the meaning is multifaceted and changing over time. It's uh, socio culturally constructed and uh, affected both historically and politically. So in trying to boil down what is you know, the fundamental between these terms, um, uh, I've come to view these gender terms as simply monikers, where when masculine is used to describe something, it is uh, usually meaning something as universal, normative, or typical. When feminine is used to describe something, it's usually construed as being particular, different, or other. I think importantly, the term feminine, meaning different, um, does not, but not always, carry negative connotations. And I think that the way to destabilize the status quo and this perception is to encourage, recognize, and celebrate this difference. I think that has far more um, uh, impactful implications in our work in music and in society in general. Moving on to Helene Sixou, she uh, introduces this concept called écriture féminine, or feminine writing, which aimed to establish a style of writing by focusing on the woman's experience, uh, thereby producing a form of dissemination that deviates from conventional or masculine forms of writing. Sixou posits two important paradigms, the first being individuality, which is a reaction against conformity and uh, the universal, and then secondly is publicization, making that individuality known to a wider audience. Um, uh, and both of these paradigms lead toward emancipation, a, a freeing from the ideological repression uh, by resisting, subverting, and deviating from the established norm. Sana Iti, influenced by Sixu, writes that the one factor that we may assume unites every kind of writing said to be feminine is subversiveness. 
However, Sixu does not clearly outline what factors or features constitute feminine writing because it's impossible to define a practice of uh, subversion based on features alone, as meanings continue to change and evolve over time. But if we know what we are subverting, defining the norm within a given field, it then becomes possible to align certain characteristics as anomalous or divergent within a certain field. So taking these ideas of difference and subversion and applying it to performance, the first question we can ask is, what are we subverting and why? Um, what are we subverting is the current or the modern performance aesthetic. And why we're doing so, uh, at least for me, is because I believe that there is a real stagnation in interpretation. Since the mid 20th century, performance aesthetics in classical music have focused on accurate or faithful text replication. And this has become the universal standard uh, that you know, we are trained in performance. Um, I'm sure many of us, myself included, uh, uh, were taught piano in this way. However, in this pursuit of textual perfe perfection, um, it's perhaps inadvertently created this regime of uniformity. Uh, here is a fantastic quote uh, that I borrowed uh, from Neil by David Dubal, uh, which is, modern performance practice has held the composer's score sacred. This and the deadly perfection of recording have helped to homogenize musical interpretation, producing blandness which threatens musical life and alienates many young performers from the spirit of the music. This creates a rather uncomfortable paradox. Um, as accurate and as precise a performer can be, um, you can never be as precise as the text itself. So whilst we advocate that um, uh, this is the one true approach to performance, it really is inherently an impossible goal to attain. Suzanne Kusick writes that this aesthetic indoctrination forces a, comp a performer to remain uh, inferior and obedient to the text. And expression is simply uh, a product of that obedience. Uh, this quote I really like, which is, um, they, speaking of the composer and the composition, are the universals, and I and my work, the performer, are the particulars, which can be aligned to uh, my definition of masculine and feminine. Her solution is to produce a resistive performance, uh, one that goes beyond the prescribed narratives of the text by promoting individuality um, to alleviate this uh, power imbalance between composer and performer. A similar concept existed in the 19th century, this duality between a correct or beautiful performance. Um, discussed by Hamel and Spohr in the instrumental treatises, um, a Richtiger Vortrag focuses on the accurate delivery of the notes, whilst a Schoener Vortrag uh, animates the music in the way that uh, the composer or the music intends, but could not fully notate, uh, allowing the artistry of the individual to dictate the realization of this music. So by combining all of these ideas, um, I have adopted the terms masculine and feminine um, as a moniker to describe approaches to performance. The current performance practice of text adherence I'm considering to be uh, masculine as it is the universal and typical approach that we are trained in music. Um, whereas a distinct individual interpretation that pushes past permissible uh, changes I would consider to be feminine. Um, and in this case specifically, uh, by subverting the text, um, we are able to perhaps produce a divergent and unique performance. And this idea really resonates with me because um, over the years, I have really felt the confines of classical performance to be quite restrictive. And uh, so how can you break out of it? So for me, 19th century historical performance practice has been the way that I've expanded my toolbox of resistive practices. Um, uh, it's grounded in many early 20th century recordings uh, and performance treatises. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to hear 19th century artists such as Leszczyk-Titsky and Sansons performing Chopin on early piano rolls. And that gives us a very uh, clear window of that sound realm. Uh, there is also a lot of contemporary work in this field. Uh, many of these practices, such as asynchrony and arpeggiation, have been detailed by none other than Neil here at the Conservatorium. 
So I just want to briefly demonstrate uh, a few of the most common uh, uh, historical performance practices. Um, here is an excerpt from the Nocturne that I will play later today. And um, let's start by hearing a recording by Baron Boyan. Uh, this would be considered the typical, a typical interpretation of this passage. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's going to mute itself again. Um, <laughs> So um, you heard in the excerpt uh, the, the notes, they, both the hands come in at the same time, so it sounds... Asynchrony is the practice of playing one hand after the other, so it sounds a bit more like this. And this, this effect uh, produces a much uh, a clear dynamic contrast between the lines. Um, it produces a, a, a clearer texture and it helps with noise projection. Uh, this next one is tempo modification, which I think is what we're um, more accustomed to, which is the uh, quickening and slackening of time. So, uh, if I were to play, I can make it a bit faster here. Hopefully that sounds a bit faster and slower for tempo purposes. Um, the next one is re-rhythmization, which is changing the note placement of So, for instance, uh, in that first one, we have the, the, the triplets. Uh, a re rhythmization may be having it as a dotted figure instead. Um, another example in the, uh, the third bar, where you have the quadruplet on top. So, instead of playing it as an organ three, I might decide to play it as. I think the most interesting is um, uh, improvised ornaments or ornamentation, uh, which is uh, taking, taking a passage from the music but changing it around almost completely by using it as a base and um, uh, producing fresh ideas. So, uh, for instance, um, if we have, uh, let's say, And I also just want to uh, briefly talk about this piano. Uh, this is a player built around 1845, which is... Okay. Um, I also want to talk briefly about this piano. Uh, this is a player uh, built around 1845 um, uh, from the Conservatorium's Historical Piano Collection. Uh, this is a piano from Chopin's era, um, and it was also said that uh, he preferred the sound and the touch of this piano. 
Um, I've been very fortunate enough to be able to spend some time with her the past few weeks, um, and it's really uh, opened uh, new, uh, it's, it's really given me more, I guess, individual agency and confidence to try out some of these uh, practices, um, uh, knowing that, you know, this is a piano, that an instrument that Chopin would have used himself, um, and then the, the sound and the individual touch uh, really lends itself to Chopin's playing. So, for instance, um, the bass notes, it's, it's deep, but it's still quite clear. So some of these things I would not normally try out on modern grand, they do work on this piano. And then in the upper registers, it's really, really quite bright, um, uh, which really lends itself to some of these large, you know, uh, ornamental uh, ornamentations that you'll hear later on in the nocturne. Blues one? Okay, sure. Okay. So why Chopin's nocturnes? Um, Chopin's music has, uh, I guess, always been associated with you know, smallness, femininity, and uh, a lack of power. But why is this music uh, so, so popular and remains so to this day? I think it's because that Chopin's music um, uh, innately facilitates the feminine, which in this case is the subversion of the text. Uh, this quote from Itty writes, performing Chopin's notation exactly from the score would appear unmusical. Uh, you know, this, this, the stylistically correct performance results from the use of agogics and the handling of musical time, all factors that you know, musical notation cannot fully indicate. Specifically on the nocturnes, uh, the improvisatory nature of the genre uh, also adds to this idea. Um, we have typically an arpeggiated accompaniment uh, and uh, a, flowing, a flowing melody. The influence uh, of bel canto opera is also clear. You know, Chopin was a lover of, of the Italian opera, and uh, you can hear lots of rhythmic freedoms and flowing coloraturas in these nocturnes as well. Another quote that I've taken from, from Neil is, uh, this suggests that both Chopin and Liszt uh, would have never performed the same piece in the same way twice. They would replace previously written passages with freshly improvised ones and make spontaneous changes to the timing, dynamics, timbre, accentuation. Um, and then both Chopin and Liszt uh, really encouraged this approach to performance, seeing uh, improvisation as an integral part of being a complete performer. It's interesting that there are traces of these historical practices present in current Chopin performance, uh, but it really, it really pales in comparison to some of these uh, 19th century artists in terms of the quality, uh, intensity, and frequency of these practices. So I have two uh, examples uh, to show you. The first is uh, by Juliana Avdiva, who was the 2010 winner of the Chopin competition. noticeably different between the two examples. So um, now I will attempt to incorporate all these ideas um, uh, in my performance of Chopin's Nocturne in B major and uh, hope to challenge uh, your perception of the feminine or the divergent even further. Should I bring this over here? 
just playing. Uh, this?
Yes. Oh, I just have one more, ah. one more concluding remark. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, I just wanted to uh, conclude with uh, a few key takeaways. Um, a feminine performance uh, for me is a subversive practice that uh, really facilitated uh, a unique and emancipatory performance experience. Uh, by resisting and deviating from the established tradition, um, it really balanced the power struggle between the composer and the performer. Um, it, it, uh, although you know, this dichotomy between the masculine and feminine will remain, I think it's possible to expand the domain of the feminine by reintroducing these historical techniques. Uh, by acknowledging and facilitating and celebrating this, dif this difference, um, I think we can really begin to reimagine this music. Uh, thank you all so much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Jack, thank you so much for, I mean, this amazing, beautiful performance. Um, Jack sent me a recording of this because he was a bit concerned and it actually almost made me cry, so there's the feminine coming out in me if I say that. Although, um, I, I was just thinking that, you know, we're sitting here with two black Fazioli pianos and this play of, and you did sort of touch on it but part of this sort of dichotomy, just hearing you play it and using, using the techniques mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. I was struck by the fact that, and I have not thought of it this, like this before, but the fact that getting that instrument here mm -hmm. and giving it a go and bringing it back to life, because you've actually brought the instrument back to life as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is also part of this, what you're talking about. Yep. The, mm -hmm. like, the, the subversive. Yep. We, yep. We're in a conservatorium where those black pianos are the things that are most played. That's most right. of our students, most of our piano students here have ne never come to play this instrument. We've had it for 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, there's something interesting there. I don't know if you want to say no, something. No, no, that, that. that actually um, completely, completely um, uh, aligns with, you know, my talk. You know, even the use of instrument uh, really is also subversive practice. Um, uh, I can seldom think of any, you know, international, you know, competition where, you know, these types of pianos are used, um, uh, you know, in recordings, you know, it's very, very rare that you would hear this, you have to, like, specifically go out of your way to find a, a, a performer or a group that would use historical instruments um, and play in this type of manner. Um, and certainly myself, uh, until, until a few weeks ago, I've never even touched anything like this, okay? So um, uh, it's really been quite a, a, an amazing experience all around to be exposed to um, uh, this instrument. Jonathan, if you would like to unmute yourself and we'll mute the lectern mic. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Jack. Um, first, yeah, I just wanted to say it was, um, I really enjoyed your playing. It was uh, really beautiful. Um, and I guess your your concept of the, the subversive, um, I guess, I mean, it's, um, it's wonderful to have a, um, you know, I, I think it echoes uh, the things that Leach Wilkins has, has said about uh, transgressive performance. I must admit, I'm, I feel a little bit um, less convinced about um, equating that with the feminine, at least in the 19th century. I suppose in a more modern context, it seems more natural to describe feminine as otherness. But uh, um, I wonder what your your evidence are, and I just thought, a few thoughts. I think that there's also other associations with these gender roles in the 19th century that that feminine is often involved, um, associated with the sentimental, the domestic, and those things might be considered sort of safe. Um, and I think where the things where fem feminine music making began, becomes transgressive, transgressive potentially is where it threatens male roles. So I think sometimes female performers on the concert stage was potentially threatening at times, at least in sort of in uh, polite English society, for instance. But I wonder where you what your what what were the what was the sort of um, 
do you have evidence from the period that was suggesting these these associations for you? I can't hear the sound again, sorry. <laughs> Hello, Jonathan, can you hear me? Yes, yes, great. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so um, so from, the, from the period, no, I don't have any evidence that um, this would be considered a feminine style of playing. Um, you've heard from the excerpt um, uh, from Leszczycki, who um, uh, was trained in piano in that period, that that would be considered, that would be considered the actual, the, the normative or the typical style of playing um, of that era. Um, where I, I really like your idea of saying transgressive and how it threatens, I think this is more applicable to performance style in today, uh, in, in today's performance aesthetic. You know, if I were to, you know, play something like this for my, you know, uni exam or, or perhaps for an AMEB exam, okay, that would be, you know, it, it, would, it would be frowned upon quite, quite immediately, I'd say. Um, so I think that is where um, uh, the subversiveness and this transgressive practice comes in, which is, which I've likened to uh, the feminine. So it's just for, just for the present day, just for contemporary practice, specifically for, for performance. Thank you, Jonathan. First of all, thank you for your wonderful presentation and play. I very much enjoyed it. Thank and you. I'm full on lining. I would like to ask you more something in regards also of the feminine. Do you find also the feminine as something more introvert in, an, in a positive way? Mm -hmm. Because in today's concert halls, mm -hmm. where neither this piano nor all the subtleties in the piano playing mm -hmm. couldn't actually come out unless you're in a more smaller venue. That's and mm -hmm the more introvert, the more reflective, with also a more audience, which is also more receptive mm. and not, you know, that power on and virtuosic. <laughs> that's, that's true. I've, I've, not, I've not considered the, I guess, the intimacy of, you know, the venue and of the audience um, actually until just now. But I think that's something, that will be something interesting to look, look into. I mean, certainly, um, you know, with this piano, it's not as loud as, you know, the modern grands and we're not in, you know, those big halls. Perhaps that is uh, more reflective of this introverted nature. But I don't think it's, I don't think we can equate feminine to being just introverted in, 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 as a general sense. I think it's really quite specific based on the, uh, the context, the person, and, you know, many other factors, so. I didn't mean only introvert in the sense of to the introvert in the about you know in the subtlety, subtlety in the nuanced and also showing actually more vulnerability which is today not very much yeah. in the culture yeah um so nuance yeah i i, I would say that i would say that there is there is still there is still much nuance in modern current performance aesthetic playing but perhaps uh, with my approach reinvigorates my interest um, uh, in playing Chopin music and you know, that I've listened to this uh, to and played this music for so many years and it's kind of become a little bit bland and so yep. this is a way that I have maybe uh, just expanded that ability to have more nuances. So. Could I ask you also, do you have experience? Did you give concerts also by playing in that way? Um, no, this is uh, my first time. <laughs> <laughs> this is your first time, so congratulations for that one. Yeah, um, that's, <laughs> That's why I, um, uh, uh, last week I sent a recording um, on this piano to Neil and just, uh, just saying like, well, hey Neil, do you think this had any legs? I, I have no idea <laughs> if this is any good or not. Um, if it's terrible, please let me know. I'll just, I'll just, I'll, we'll just play on a normal piano and do it normally. Who cares? It's fine, okay? <laughs> we'll just throw it all out, okay? That's fine, so. Um, yeah. This so, was very yes, touching. First, first time uh, just doing this in a concert setting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can we 
please put our hands together. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.